Okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jules from The Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord server. Today, we're doing part two of a dialogos between myself and Capello, who's here. Hi, Capello. Greetings. Happy to be here. We're also really pleased to have, well, two uh, inspirational figures, you would say, for the community that we're in which is John Viveki and Paul Van der Clay. Hello, guys. Hey, Julian Capello. Thank you so much for making the time. So um, Capello and I are going to start off uh, by trying to do a little bit of a pre preparatory presentation each because the rough... Uh, area that we're trying to navigate here is uh, the conversation between Christianity and shamanism, shamanism and Christianity. Um, so I'm going to go first. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen. And where am I? Okay, can you all see my screen there? Mm -hmm. I can. Great. <laughs> Looks like Andre's online. Hey, Andre. Okay, so what I'm going to be attempting to do in three minutes, we've got three minutes each, is to give a summary of John's uh, introduction to the Awakening to the Meaning Crisis series. It's a happy accident, actually, that... Andre, hey, happy accident that uh, this topic came up between Capello and I. Uh, and I actually didn't realize that John started his series um, by actually discussing shamanism. So that's interesting. I myself am a Christian. That's where the dialogue's happening. So look, I hope uh, no more notifications come in. <clears throat> so here I'm going to be trying to summarize what John's probably taken a decade or more to <laughs> work, work out. <laughs> okay. So in the series, John, uh, we start off obviously today and John says, well, if we're going to really have a look at meaning, we have to go back as far as we can all the way back to, I suppose, the most uh, firm kind of information that we have, which is the Upper Paleolithic era, era about 40,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, when I um, was getting a hold of that, I sort of realised how hard it is for me to imagine that, uh, what it would be like there. And I was comparing it to the other important um, era that John was pointing out, which is the Axial Age. And I tried to do a timeline there to kind of give you a feeling for uh, what you need to do in order to uh, come to grips with this. Um, so John uh, did, did that by uh, using the work of Matt, Matt Rosano, yeah. who pointed out that about roughly 20,000 years before the Upper Paleolithic, some event happened, some sort of majorly catastrophic event, which meant that the number of uh, people, Homo sapiens at the time, uh, dwindled significantly. And let's just say if that is us, we were thrown back on our resources, which forced us to develop some rituals, which John then explicates as trading rituals, initiation rituals, and importantly, shamanism. So the adaptions that come from that are that in trading rituals, you are forced then to have to take perspectives of other people. When it comes to taking the perspectives of other people, you also have to be able to 
trust that the people that you are uh, working with at the moment aren't going to be more interested in new people than you. So you go through initiation rites. And then finally, this um, phenomena of shamanism develops where with these adaptations also come blockages. John likes to say, not to put words in your mouth, but uh, the thing that makes you adaptive is also the things that, I can't remember John, but it also blocks you up. John also introduced a concept called acceptation, which the importance of that from Michael Anderson, the importance of that is that biologically, the way our brain works is a reuse principle so that rather than one particular part of our brain, like the occipital lobe being just for vision, our brain actually kind of works as a team. So different parts are helping each other out and reforming to do special things. And so these particular adaptations also meant profound changes to the way our brains were structured. John also coined a phrase, but I think other people did too, called psychotechnology. And shamanism, he's saying specifically, is breaking the frame of those adaptations. So what is shamanism? Um, the way it gets broken down is this classical shamanism. In 1951, this chap, Mircea Eliad, who was a Romanian emigre, wrote a book about shamanism where he synthesized the data from the original kind of anthropological expeditions that came from the Russian takeover of Siberia. And this became the kind of touchstone of what shamanism got defined as. So this classical form, although it's impossible to summarize, I think to make a distinction, he was saying is that these people who had special kind of status went through some serious initiation, either for the community or from the community or by the community or by spirits. There's another kind of Christ, uh, Christianity, shamanism uh, that was the work of this chap, Michael Harnan in 1980, who basically wanted to take the principles of shamanism as he understood them. He actually went and did ethnographic work and created a core set of uh, practices which people could do. And uh, I was helped by Angela Puka, who worked with Sevi Slavin on the shamanism, where she was talking about something called direct revelation. These shamans were, or this practice of shamanism allows you to have some sort of access to insight, which John talks about later. John also very helpfully uh, indicated the work of Michael Winkum, Winkleman, who synthesizes these two points of view. And he puts it this way, there's a remarkable similarity worldwide among spiritual healers of hunter-gatherer, horticultural and pastoral societies who use altered states of consciousness to interact with the spirit world on behalf of their community. Now, because time's running out, I'm just going to have to pump through this. That's kind of roughly the picture of sort of shamanistic practices around the world. That maps from Wikipedia. The word shaman comes from Siberia, meaning one who knows um, so obviously someone over in South America is not technically a shaman because it's a Siberian word. But anyway, Winkerman did this interesting thing where he's talking about what's happening in those altered states of consciousness. And he talks about the triune brain here, the reptile brain, the emotional brain, that they start doing theta waves. They start producing theta waves. And this starts moving upwards into the prefrontal cortex where we're doing our conscious processing and then starts um, coordinating it back into these theta waves. And that's what's occurring. So now this conscious brain is talking to the unconscious brain and this is where you're getting all of these mystical experiences. <clears throat> John's definition was that shamanism is psychotechnology. And what's it doing? Breaking the frame of adaptations, acceptation to those new demands. And that's done through the subconscious knowing of flow state. 
Correct me if I'm wrong, John, I don't know if it's subconscious, semi-conscious or what. <clears throat> Flow state, when you are doing some activity, you're either going to be anxious that you're not doing well enough or you're going to be bored that maybe you're not doing enough. You try and find your way into this middle bit called a flow channel and um, then you're in the flow. What are the conditions for flow? The founder of flow, Chick sent me high, says you got to have what you would experience as a rock climber. That came the wrong way around. Sorry. Clear I just want to interject. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Chick sent me high. Just died a few days ago. Oh, that's tragic. He had a very interesting story. Yeah, so I just thought I'd, it's appropriate just to indicate that, just so maybe a a, a, a second or two of respect, because uh, yeah, he just died a few days ago. I didn't know that. Thank you, John. And obviously, he must be very important to you. Yes. What, if I can do a quick aside, what was interesting to me about Chick Semi High was that he was the son of Holocaust survivors. And he was interested in how some of them did really well. And I think that's what started him out on flow. The conditions that he outlined were clear information, tight feedback, error matters. I'm going somewhere with this. John pointed out rock climbers do that. You can really tell when error matters if you're about to fall off the side of a mountain. But I liked more the uh, musician one. I like to play music where if you look at John Coltrane, John saying what's happening in flow is really this kind of pattern. Person's kind of going subconsciously, oh, this works, this works, yeah, this works, this will probably work. Oh no, got to reframe. This might work. Yeah, this works, this works, etc. Sorry, that's my attempt at describing John's uh, cascade of insights. So there's a pattern there that people are picking up somehow in what they're doing in their connection, um, which I guess we call intuition. John breaks that down uh, to implicit learning, which is the picking up of patterns. It's not a kind of spooky thing. Basically, we unconsciously or subconsciously, et cetera, et cetera, can pick up on patterns biologically, but it can't be explicit. It can never be explicit. That's why this all happens in this kind of flow state. Nearly done. Sorry, Capello. What John and his colleagues did, which was interesting, was noticed that the science of intuition matches exactly the science of flow in terms of what you can do. What you can know is increase the conditions to improve your intuition. They're exactly the same. And that's an interesting pattern recognition by John. Um, and so John's basically arguing in a shamanism, you're getting these two functions of the human being working together. And that ultimately that produces, uh, where am I? Metaphor. And metaphor is profoundly uh, sets the direction for us as humans. It's at the heart of science and art, as John said. So we're back to that Winkleman thing. Um, anyway, so I, I'm left with a few questions, which maybe I'll come to later about Christianity, but I better stop. Thank you for listening to that. Thanks, Jules. That was really good. Thank you. That was great. I mean, it's it's weird hearing myself talked about in the third person like that, but that was very that was very good. That was very good. I I, I guess I would add a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would emphasize that uh, the kinds of insight and improvements in intuitive in intuition are happening largely in in the procedural, perspectival, and participatory domain. The shaman is playing with identities, altered states of consciousness. Uh, playing with narrative and other kinds of skills. And that's largely what's being, uh, uh, um, uh, I guess, enhanced. And now, of course, the shaman translates that into propositional utterances, uh, narrates what's happening often, et cetera. Uh, but I wanted to emphasize, um, although there's a lot of variation in the propositional claims that come out of shamanic states, there's a lot of universality in terms of the enhancement of procedural, perspectival, and participatory transformation and knowing. 
so I, I, I just wanted to uh, add that point, if that's okay. Of course. Over to you, Capilla. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna share my screen here in a second, but uh, I just wanted to say thanks again to John and Paul for being here. Um, John, you've been a huge influence on me and, and my sort of journey that I've been on. And Paul, I really enjoy your, your videos a lot and uh, they're just fascinating to watch and you, you have a great style. Um, and um, I also just wanna say that like everything I'm about to do here is gonna be more like, Julian talked about setting the table. This is gonna be more like an hors d'oeuvre platter <laughs> of what we could talk about. So um, it's not really definitive and everything I'm about to sort of share is not from a perspective of any kind of expertise either about shamanism or Christianity. I'm more here as a member of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord community as somebody who's discovering and I'm here based on what I don't know as much as what I do know. So I just wanna make that clear that this is sort of gonna be more something to get us started on our thought process a little bit. And I'll try to go through it pretty quickly. Uh, Julian, can you enable screen sharing for uh, other participants? Sorry, Capilla, give me one second. Should be good to go, Capella. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna start with the Jonathan Peugeot quote, uh, which I really liked. Um, Hybridity and darkness do not just appear at the outer edge, but they also appear at the inner limit as the veil covering the glory of God. He was writing this in reference to um, hybridity and icons that might seem exotic or strange, but I think it applies very well to the figure of the shaman in the sense that um, the shaman is in a sense, um, both particularly for our modern society, the margins of religious experience in a lot of ways, it's sort of something that mo most modern populations would find to be um, exotic uh, in some ways, but it's also primordially central to religious experience itself. And I would say that the history of human spirituality. Um, we're looking at uh, Cosker Cave in France here. Um, this site is, very old. Um, I would say it's about 10 times older than the pyramids um, is when it was the first drawings were used. Um, these are some horses here. Um, but the thing that really draws me to this site um, in my thoughts is this, which doesn't look like much, but these are, these are hand prints, uh, hand tracings by people who entered the cave um, they're on the ceiling of the cave where the, the, the rock is somewhat soft. And um, some of the, they would go into the cave and it wasn't just about looking at the animals. It was about, it was a tactile experience. They were touching, um, they were touching where not only the animals through these tracings, but where the hands of other people had gone there before had been. And um, these are children's hands as well. So, Somebody would have had to bring children down there. Uh, it's about a 500 foot um, walk through a, a narrow dark passage. Um, it would have been very difficult to do um, with just fire and then lift the child up to have this tactile experience. Um, we don't know exactly what the contents of the cave represented uh, for these people, probably 
because it was used for 8,000 years, probably between different groups of people, different languages, different cultures. It probably re represented different things. It probably wasn't just one thing. But this desire to go back and this desire to be grounded and to touch the sacred, in a sense, um, is I think also why we keep coming back to these sort of topics and, and keep trying to sort of explore this boundary between um, what is on the margins and, and what appears to us um, to be at the center. Um, <clears throat> this is an ancient Greek maenad um, associated with the cult of Dionysus. Um, this is really more like a placeholder for me in terms of like remembering that in Europe after a certain point, shamanism in its classical form disappears. Um, and Michael Winkleman talks about this in his research where once you have a priestly class, they sort of, shamanism does, doesn't disappear completely, but it sort of breaks off into these other groups of healers and seers and other uh, what are called magical religious specialists. And this would have been the environment that um, uh, like the religious environment that Christianity would have blossomed in is, is a place where um, there would have been sort of refugia, cultural refugia of these practices still going on. But a lot of the classical forms of that brought everything together into shamanism that really made heavy use of altered states of consciousness, um, it, would have, it would have really departed from that classical form at that point. Um, if I had read The Immortality Key, I'd probably talk about it here, but I haven't. Um, Paul, I enjoyed your video on it. Uh, I will say that I'm somewhat skeptical that, well, let's just say there are many different ways to enter altered states of consciousness. I will leave it at that for the sake of brevity. Um, these are the Benedanti. So this is one of the last sort of good, reliable, cases of shamanism in Europe um, that we get. This is from the 1500s. Um, they were discovered by the Inquisition and subsequently persecuted. Um, these were people who would go into a trance state at night and fly around in the, the other world, as it's sometimes called, um, in order to protect livestock and um, agricultural fields from what they perceived to be evil witches. Um, the Inquisition promptly said that you guys are witches too. Um, but it's interesting that prior to that, these Benedanti, which means good walkers in, in Italian, this was a Northern Italian tradition, um, they considered themselves Christian. They did not see any uh, problem between what they were doing and, and Christianity. Um, uh, Julia, I'm glad you mentioned Angela Puca, um, who has researched Italian shamanism. Um, and by Italian shamanism, I want to, again, go back to this idea that the classical form of shamanism is sort of broken down historically at this point. But also, there's kind of a trend now in uh, the study of shamanism, which is really pushing the boundaries of what we consider to be altered states of consciousness. And I would like to return to this later, um, especially with you, John, you know, is are certain forms of dialogos an altered state of consciousness? Is uh, what you experienced during Lectio Divina, an altered state of consciousness, where Angela Puka, uh, who has a great YouTube channel um, that talks about this stuff, would claim that um, what's going on here, this is, uh, this is uh, an Italian, um, I guess you could call it a ritual, a form of folk healing, um, that involves putting oil and water uh, to see if you have received the evil eye from somebody. Um, and it is, uh, it's, it's, it's a Christian thing. So it's sort of like, um, but the interaction between the patient and the, um, the person performing the act, um, the boundary between selves is, becomes fluid. Is that an altered state of consciousness? In the classical sense of going into a trance state? No, but a lot of anthropologists, you know, more recently have sort of questioned the centrality of trans states specifically to this, this broader thing of, of shamanism. Um, this is um, Basilia Gomez uh, Valenzuela, who is a Ureme Curandero in Mexico. Again, you can see a lot of the Christian imagery here. Um, this is, a, a, again, it sort of is this blend of, of folk magic, folk healing, Christianity, but also arguably shamanism. 
Um, this is Sophia Baylor, who was a um, Pennsylvania Dutch powwow doctor. Um, if you've never heard of Pennsylvania Dutch powwow, um, it is a form of uh, folk healing, arguably folk magic, uh, within the largely Protestant uh, tradition of um, German colonists to uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch region of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is kind of a good example of shamanism or something that is shamanic, at least um, taking place in a Protestant context. Um, the Protestants are, um, you know, the, the importance of text and printing is pretty, pretty big. What do you do when you need to um, adapt new practices um, or old practices to the text? Well, you make more text, uh, including a new books of Moses uh, were printed. These were widely circulated as far back as the 1700s. Um, and they were they made their way down into Appalachia as well. Um, and in Appalachia, there's a, a very old tradition of what are sometimes called granny women. Uh, this woman here is an Ozark uh, native uh, named Jean Wallace, who was a seer and a, a granny woman. In Appalachia, a granny woman is, will do folk healing, um, but they will also uh, often act as midwives um, and they will often sit vigil for the dead. So this is a part of the world where up until very recently, burials were done at home and death was dealt with by the immediate family. Um, they would help prepare the body and sit with the body um, at vigil. Um, it's also worth mentioning that, that in these sort of more remote parts of the United States, um, the rates of stillbirth and other pregnancy related problems would have been very high. Um, even in, in the United States today, it's, it's higher than most people think. It's around, you know, late term stillbirth can be at 3% or so of the population, which is, is kind of scary. Um, so these were folk healers who were really working at the uh, edge in some ways of life and death, um, both at the beginning and the end. Um, again, it's very, well, it's very shamanic in some ways. Uh, into modern times or, or more recent times, this is Dorothy McLean, who was one of the co-founders of the Findhorn community in Scotland. It's, uh, today it's described as an eco-village. Back in the 60s, it probably would have been described as a commune. Um, and this is sort of where shamanic, I guess, styles of thinking and shamanic practices sort of come into this sort of um, the new age movement, for lack of a better word. Um, but um, also in a Christian context, uh, Dorothy McLean was, was kind of famous for um, using Jesus to talk to plants, for lack of a better word. Um, and it kind of goes back to this almost uh, granular attachment or, or confrontation with the sacred, which is kind of unique to shamanism. Um, this is a scene from the uh, Takawasi Center, which I believe is in Peru, um, where uh, psychedelic therapy in the form of ayahuasca is used uh, to help treat addiction and mental health. Um, but you can see the Christian imagery here. Um, a lot of the uh, practitioners of, of ayahuasca medicine in Latin America are doing so in a Christian context and they're, they're using Christian prayers um, and imagery in their work. Um, that's sort of where I wanna leave it in ter terms of the modern day, in terms of thinking about like, where, where do things sort of stand? What can we sort of glean from this is there, a, is there a pivot from this sort of folk healing um, and way of caring about each other in human communities that is relevant to the meaning crisis for one thing, but also um, capable of pivoting to, to these broader concerns of, of not just um, helping each other in, in small isolated communities or with specific problems, 
but ways of, I don't know, uh, addressing the meaning crisis itself and uh, tackling larger sort of societal concerns. And I will leave it there. That was excellent. Thank you very much. I agree, both presentations were outstanding. I really appreciated them. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, John. What would you prefer? Would you like uh, Paul and I to sort of riff on what the presentations are, just some initial, initial thoughts? And I'm sure we will start, as we always do, uh, to uh, spark each other into a deeper dialogue. Is that what you'd like to happen now? I just want, this is your channel. I want to follow what you would like to happen. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I love the Dialogo style and I, I kind of like the decentralized, let it emerge thing, John. So I suppose whatever um, whatever you feel led to do. Yeah. So everything so, sounds good. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that came up for me right away. Um, I, I, I didn't talk about it and I, I should have, but that the touching of the, that, that, that's such a primordial thing. Um, David, David Lewis Williams argues in um, Mind in the Cave that the, the cave walls were not like how we perceive them as barriers. They were actually membranes. They were points of contact and conformity with the sacred. Um, and I think that's example. I, I think it's hard to interpret uh, the, the touching of the caves as anything other than that. It's obviously a repeated act. It's going on for centuries, right? Millennia. The children are being brought. They're made to touch. I mean, it's, uh, the, to me, uh, the profundity of that and how, how that, how, think about the, the metaphors that are still with us about the sacred as above us, uh, a canopy that nevertheless overshadows us, the sacred canopy. We want to reach up to it. We want to be in conformity to it. I mean, these have become archetypal uh, to our, our, our cognitive cultural grammar. Uh, the figure of the shaman, of course, has become our archetypal for us. Uh, I, I could make sort of several Jungian and post-Jungian arguments about that. The archetypal figure keeps showing up. Uh, you have, you know, you have Yoda in Star Wars and Merlin and, uh, and Gandalf, et cetera, et cetera. And these are clearly shamanic figures. So um, I think one of the points that Capella was making it, and I, I'd like to emphasize is shamanism, right? Shamanism is still with us in some ways, and it's also very distant from us from another. And that's why I liked that, that whole move. I mean, we carry it in the guts of our psyche um, in, 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 in the very images in, in which we try to enact the sacred that, that's still there, that heritage is woven deeply into us. But in the other sense, the shaman seems so dif distant from us. And when we, when we see shamanism being integrated into Christianity and even into modernity, it often seems uncanny. I, those, those types of things strike me as uncanny. Um, I, uh, they, they strike me as, hmm, like, uh, I, I'm not, uh, my reaction to them is they seem intercategorical uh, precisely. Um, and of course, um, uh, that's, I suppose, an echo of the people who um, persecuted these individuals as heretics or as witches or as uh, whatever. Um, there's something else going on there. And that suggests to me that, right, it's the way, the, the way shamanism is being taken up into more current sacredness. It's not a ladder. We didn't leave the shaman behind. Um, in, in a full sense, but it's not just um, a, a transposition. There's a layering of other grammars on top of the shamanic one, and they interact in ways that only semi make sense to us. That's my best sort of estimate as to why they, I'll use a, a colloquialism, why they kind of creep us out a bit. It's like, what's going on there? Um, and how do I make sense of that? Um, What's going on in an ayahuasca ceremony where people are uh, obviously going through a, a shamanic type ritual, but there's Christian symbolism there, and yet they're all sitting around with electric lighting in modern clothing, like they're clearly not hunter gatherers. So like, what, how, is all, how are all of these things coming together? And 
I, I, I assume they're not just a kludge. Maybe they are for some people, but I assume they're not just a kludge. I assume something's going on there, but it, figuring out what that is, maybe that's part of what we want to try and uh, talk about here. Because I would, I would propose to you the following, trying to answer, the, I don't know, the epistemic, dogmatic, metaphysical questions about the relationship between shaman and Christianity are not going to properly be addressed until we get at this deeper stuff about how are these different cognitive cultural grammars of the sacred interacting and why are we experiencing these hybridizations in the way we do? Um, and, and, you know, and Jonathan likes to point out, um, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I was just tweeting about Jonathan's work today, but Jonathan likes to point out how these, how these patterns are both uh, perennial, but also disturbing in a, in a very important way for us. Um, and so that's my first initial sort of attempt to formulate a problem for discussion for us. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my, that's my initial response. Okay, I'll go next. I, I, I really enjoyed both of your presentations. Um, Julian, I thought your presentation was a, a really clear and um well put together distillation of you know john's work in a very short time it's a very difficult thing to do it was really wonderful and Thank you. um and capello your presentation of that there was yours was much more intuitive here are images your are images of 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 things that I, I i love how john just put it together they're uncanny and i think the so much of what I saw in the Caribbean when I worked there had that sense. I worked with Haitian, Haitian immigrants to the Dominican Republic. And so you had voodoo, you had Santeria, you had, you know, people who were living in a very different, I mean, there's a lot of worlds coming together when you have people who are leaving Haiti, sneaking into the Dominican Republic to pick coffee and cut sugar cane, and then church work on top of all of the stuff going on. And many of the communities, in some of the really small communities where I worked, there were two, insti well, there were two institutions that would have a building, three if you count a family, but one was the church and the other was the, was the bar. And and people would live sort of between the church and the bar and you had church every night and you had the bar with dancing and drinking and singing every night and people would sort of live in the middle of the tension of those two worlds. Um, I Just this week, I finished listening to two excellent episodes of Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook have a podcast, The Rest is History. And they had two, they had two really good episodes on paganism. And they had as their guest for those episodes, Ron Hutton, who teaches, who is a professor in the UK on, on British folklore, uh, paganism. And I, you know, I haven't had a chance yet to have been thinking about maybe doing a video about those episodes because they, he, he gets into this question as to what do we really know of what came before and his summation as a scholar is be unless we have unless we have writing where you can sort of get a sense of the mind especially in the uk we uh, we know almost nothing before the romans got there because of course the romans had writing and could give us a sense but then we only you know his his answer to the question well what were the druids do we do we really know anything about the druids and his answer was frustratingly no and it's like we don't like that answer and he says well what 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 has what we've tended to have with these very early things is sort of our own projections of what we would like them to be and they're either you know wonderful they're either you know rousseau or they're Calvinists. I mean, they're, it's, it's one way or the other. And, and so he gets into a, a bunch of these very similar things to a lot of what, what you brought through. And then, then, there, then there came the question, why, why was this stuff so amazingly, I mean, it, 
so amazingly destroyed? And, and the answer was, well, it was this thing that we call world religions that just sort of come through and, um, and just completely take over. Now, the difficulty that we're facing with this is all these images in our mind, because I think it's fair to say that these world religions don't just annihilate, but what they do is they sort of subsume. And so you have elements of shamanism that are very much alive and well today in, in just about any community you look at. And now, again, as a pastor, I see shamanistic elements all over the place in 21st century living Christian communities that have these ideas and practices. I love that plate from Italy of the oil and water for the evil eye. I remember when my um, when my wife was pregnant and we visited, we were visiting Whitensville, Massachusetts, where my mother is from, where my mother lives. And so they did the little, they, they had this little, this little test to see, um, I don't exactly what it all remember, you know, a needle and a string or something to see if it was going to be a boy or a girl, you know, and, and I was just fascinated watching this because these are, there's, there's nothing, um, <laughs> I mean, there, 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 there's nothing, nobody would look at any of the women involved in this conversation. I mean, they're all my cousins and my cousin's wives, that there's anything shamanistic about this, but it's, it usually gets categorized in our communities sort of as folk religion. And, and, and then when you look at places like two hours north of Sacramento is a, um, is a Pentecostal community that is right now, one of the most preeminent Pentecostal communities in the world, it's Bethel, Bethel Church in Reading. And I mean, they are, they are covering the world and their music and their practices. They write books about basically how to perform miracles, because they will say, well, you know, here you have the New Testament and Jesus did miracles. And what we're sort of missing in that layer are the, the how to's. And so here at Bethel, you know, we have, and this is where John is so right, because they're almost approaching it with, with scientific rigor about how to, you know, how to do a miracle. And if you read Bill Johnson, he's sort of the founding pastor. If you read his books, I mean, there's theological layer, but I, I think it's, it's helpful to see that this, this has never gone away. And I don't think it ever will go away because I think it's, it's just built into us. And for the most part, the formal religions sort of operate on different levels, but this stuff always carries on. And when you look at altered states of consciousness, I remember a, a Pentecostal pastor who thought maybe he wanted to join the Christian Reformed Church in California. I think he wanted to join because he saw that there were a bunch of these almond farmers and dairy farmers that had amazing amounts of money. And maybe by joining the denomination, he could have access to some of those resources, yada, yada. And so I was down there and, but he was a Pentecostal church. And so then they, they just, you know, sort of had this portion of the service where, you know, there's song and there's music and there's, you know, people are flowing in and out and there's a little bit of tongue speaking and there's some healing and then some praying and, you know, there's crying and it's very loose. And that pastor was kind of watching me like, you know, oh no, because this is, this is definitely not what we see in a Dutch reformed church. But, you know, I, you know, I, I'd seen a lot weirder stuff in the overseas than, than what he was doing. But in, in many ways, everything that's going on in that service and Pentecostalism is becoming in many, at least in Protestantism, the majority expression of Protestantism in the, in the developing world and increasingly even in the developed world, altered states of consciousness, um, you know, even in, in silly fundamentalist circles, you know, circles like the, they used to call it the, uh, the holy dip where you, you know, you take a Bible and you say, okay, Lord, I need an answer. Boom. And then you put your finger on a passage and, 
There's the answer. You know, this stuff doesn't go away. <laughs> so that, that's my first impression of, of at least, you know, where I sort of see this conversation with respect to the life of the church. That was really helpful. It sparked things for me. So I don't know if I can go or does someone else want to jump in? Uh, one of the um, one of the things Capello and I talked about prior to this this meeting was the idea of um, how things emerge, how things unfold as you're going forward. And what I mean to say is that. I think there is, uh, going to John's point about the cultural cognitive grammar, there is a, um, I suppose, a layer of thinking in our culture, which is that Christianity is exclusionary per se. And um, Capello and I were, I think, touching on that a little bit, but one of the people who's interesting to me is Whitehead and how he talks about God as involved very much in creativity and we're involved in creativity too and how that leaves the future open. So that sort of brings a question around about well, how much exclusivity can you have when you don't know what's going to happen next especially as regards the kind of world we live in today where things are happening all of the time. And John, we did a, a dialogos with Mark and Manuel about the religion that's not a religion and how you were talking about how creed updates need to happen almost in real time or something like that, that you have to be able to update your beliefs um, constantly. So I suppose there is that kind of part of the cultural cognitive grammar, to use John's words. There's that narrative of when people think of Christians, it's all very much about rules and don't. Whereas I'm very interested in the idea of, <clears throat> no, if you're connected to something transcendent, you are participating in life. And that if you are missing on that participation, then maybe you're not connected to what you think you're connected to. So there's that element to it. Um, John lives in Toronto and there was a happening there in 1993 called the Toronto Blessing, where a lot of the strange and uncanny, I think has been a word that's thrown around a bit, happened you know, right there in the church and kind of spread around the world. And um, I, I wanted to sort of put into the conversation a question of how those kinds of happenings might fit what John is describing at least as breaking the frame. Because I feel like what happened for a lot of Christians in, in, in that particular period was an absolute kind of awareness that kind of idea of Christianity of exclusionary and making rules is as dry as a desert. <laughs> that, you know, it is not full of life. I think there must have been an awareness of that. And this strange thing that happened in Toronto, and to be honest, there's a lot of weird stuff in it. I was around some of that stuff and I had come from a very kind of uh, hard left brain kind of position mm -hmm. and realized that I needed to get into the other space without realizing it. And so I was attracted to what was going on in the most kind of skeptical way. I thought, what the hell, what the hell's going on with these people? And um, it's sort of like, well, whatever I'm doing at the moment, isn't that much better. So I better take a look anyway. Um, so let me just put those in there and see if that helps. So uh, I'd like to reply to you. Uh, there's a lot of threads there. Um, 
let's let's but first of all let's go back to the phenomenology of the uncanny uh the uncanny valley it, the uncanny is when things are close enough that we sort of recognize them but far enough away that we're going i don't understand and that's like so when you get when you get the uh, when they're making the robots look like humans when it's either clearly robot right people are okay but it says it starts to look more and more like a human that's when you hit the uncanny valley uh, because it's similar to a human, but it's still not a human. And you're, you're getting, right, you're getting, the uncanny is uh, the same sort of place where wonder and horror, it's that place that's on the horizon of intelligibility. Um, and shamans um, were perhaps the first individuals to cultivate practices that made, that took them to the uncanny. They, they were not liked by their communities generally. They're always suspected of doing nefarious things because they're uncanny. They're weird. Even in their own community, they're odd people. That's what, they're the ones that know, like the classic sub. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think the the thing we need to know is um, that to me points to something even deeper that is is I think at the, the core of what's going on here in this discussion. And I keep referring to this book, How God Becomes Real by Lerman, who's one of the great anthropologists right now. Um, and she talks about the reality of, of spirits and, uh, and that they're not real in the two. Like, so our, our culture, our standard modernity, we have the two ways in which things can be real. The subject, they can be subjectively real. They can be objectively real. And we don't know how the heck they go together, but we'll just pretend that we'll, that's okay, right? And, and then what we, and what people like Heidegger and others have been pointing out uh, is the older, you know, the basically, at least in ancient Greece idea that, no, no, the, what grounds the possibility of them fitting together is the most real. And I, I, I tried to coin that term, the transjective. And Lerman basically argues that a lot of the, sacred phenomena are trans are, are real in a way I would call transjective and give me a sec because this ties into the very thing uh, I think we want to talk about which is these these entities don't exist by our assertion as romantic or by our reception of them from the world smashing into us objectively remember object means to smash into they exist dialogically and Jesus even says that not to be and not to be insulting, but where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. There, right? The, this is the, the idea that these the, these these entities are realized. And I know there's metaphysical questions here, and I'm happy to discuss them. But I'm trying to get right now the phenomenology and the functionality on the table. These entities are realized dialogically, right? You know, Jesus is only. And again, I'm not making a metaphysical claim here. But Jesus is only real to you if you pray to him, if you talk to him, if you let him into your life. Even You can even hear evangelical and fundamentalist language being used that way. And, and, and by the way, this is not specific to Christianity. This is Lerman's point. So this is a different sense of real. And if you'll allow me, there's, there's a transjective re realness. And it's very, very important because the transjective realness that is approached dialogically right, puts us on the horizon of intelligibility. And that's the place where we have to seriously play for transformation if we want to move from one world to another. That's the liminal zone. That's the roof of the cave, right? That place there, that, that's the cognitive roof of the cave. And what's happening in shamanism, right, is right that the monological view of the mind is being directly challenged because the shaman is basically... A, is that they're in a, they're in a dialogical identity with other entities right and theos to be possessed by the god right and they so they're challenging our monological mind they're challenging our monophasic this goes towards capella's question about well where's what's 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 a normal and what's an altered state of consciousness i agree with david lewis williams that we should stop thinking of it as a binary it's a continuum right and what we have is a certain state, and I think the state that we that we call normal consciousness is exactly the one that is highly coordinated with what you know what Taylor calls the buffered self, the monological self that is locked and closed within, and it, 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 it it's 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 protected by a barrier of completely coherent propositions that present prevent any of this 
yucky stuff from getting into us in some ways. And the shaman is uncanny because it's in us deep enough, but it calls to us to the dialogical. It calls us to the transjective horizon of intelligibility. It challenges the idea that there is one state of consciousness that gives us access to reality. And so it, that, that, that is precisely uh, uh, the issue. Uh, I think that's at hand here is the degree to which this, this uncanny stuff could be appropriated and also therefore misappropriated in order to afford a, the kind of radical transformation. I want to point out to you, Julian, that you're invoking of Whitehead, but that's that's deeply that's deeply Hebrew. The idea of an open future and that we co-create it with God, right? Whitehead is picking up on a very a, a, something that has been deeply written into us by the Judeo-Christian heritage, and so. No, like you're invoking it, right? But you're, what I'm saying is, it still fits in with this, this, and and the and the figure. One more thing, and then I'll shut up. There's a figure that sits there on the uncanny, doing all of this shamanic stuff in, in, and trying to call us into the future, not foretell the future, but that's the prophet, right? And the prophetic figure. And so, one of the challenges. And I mean, this is almost, Paul knows this better than I do, probably. Like when you do religious studies, you'll often get the priest versus the prophet, you know, schema as even understanding Christianity and the constant, and then there's the king, and then there's the weird triangle between the priest, the prophet, and the king. And somehow, and this is the, this is the, this is the thing, this is the uncanniness we have to get back, um, even as non-Christians. Jesus is somehow supposed to do all of those right? And that's what's super uncanny about him. I'm reading David Bentley Hart's translation of the New Testament, and everybody is commenting, and I totally understand why, because it makes the, un it makes the uh, sorry, the New Testament, makes the New Testament weird again, like really weird. It stops taming down the Greek text to our modern sensibility and throws it in your face in a way that's like, and I keep, uh, I'll read a passage, I do Lexio Divina, and I go, that's just weird. I don't know what that means, like, and if I go back to the older versions, they, I, I feel like I was a little bit misled. I feel like I've been duped a bit. Because when I read these older translations, they're all, they, oh, they, they make sort of wonderful sense to a, you know, a, mo a modern mind that has gone through the Enlightenment. But when you read it, the uncanniness. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to suggest to you, Julian, this is a long argument, and I'm not a Christian, but I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be fair to the, well, first of all, I love Paul, and I, I want to be fair to him, and I want to be fair to the context of the conversation, which is, possible bridging. I'm trying to show you that outside of the rules and the dogma, in the figure of Jesus, you've got all of these things, you've got everything we've been talking about in the prophet, uh, in tension with the priest, in tension with the king, and somehow going beyond all of them in a way that's deeply uncanny. I'm suggesting to you, if you look to the uncanniness, and I don't mean that insulting, if you look to the uncanniness of Jesus, that might give us a possible bridge. I'll stop talking because I've said too much and I've probably been insulting and I was desperately trying not to be. Not at all. I, I really love what John just said. I, I've, 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 never, I've never once felt insulted by John. Sometimes being from New Jersey, it's like, eh, is he really my friend until he insults me? I mean, that's just part of a Jersey thing. But um, I, I love what John just said. He got it exactly right. Jesus, prophet, priest, and thing. This, this is catechism lessons. I, I think it's also important to remember that Everyone has a, you, you do not have a system unless you have a no in the system. If you don't have a no in the system, you don't have a system. And, and I, I see this all the time. People are like, oh, the church says no. Well, of course it says no. Your body says no. Everything has to have a no in the system. Otherwise, there's no definition. Otherwise, you don't have anything that's intelligible in the world. No is simply a function of anything intelligible because it's not that it's this so there's always a no in the system and what happens in in a religious system is that parts parts will say no i just mentioned a bunch of folk religiony things so we had in the dominican republic i was in a region that was fairly far from the capital and one of the things that happen in a in a baptismal service, we only baptized adults. There's a long history to that. 
how this is a Christian Reformed church, a long history to that. Um, we only baptize adults and you would, someone would, they would dress all in white. They would march down to the water. They would go into the water. And once the pastor put them under the water, they would start to thrash. And the pastor would grab them again and plunk them again, and they'd thrash some more. And, and the pastor would just keep dunking them until finally, and there's a lot going on in there in terms of spirits and the waters, and baptism is an exorcism, and these spirits don't want to release um, someone. Some of the missionaries didn't like that, and I had one missionary friend who, when he would see that, he was in another outlying area, he would wade into the water, grab the person himself, and this isn't, this isn't the proper way to do a baptism, and we had the president of the national church once by us watching this, and he's looking at, he's, he's watching this, he's saying, this doesn't happen when we do baptisms in the capital, and it's like, and I, you know, to me, this was, this is the working through of all of you know they're going from voodoo these are these are people who are living up in the mountains they're going from voodoo into christianity but that christianity is going to be different it's going to be in tension with all sorts of other things and expect conflict expect someone to come in with a big no but i think this dynamic and i i really love the way john you know puts this 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 dynamic just recognizes that this is why Christianity has been so potently, um, it has, has been such an amazing religion at crossing into new cultures and somehow forming, you know, new modes of Christianity, which at the same time are all sort of recognized. I mean, it's, an, it's just, even if you're not a Christian, just the story of what Christianity how it's gone over the world, it's an astounding thing because, you know, I, I it was, um, it was Fry or Northrop Fry who in his lectures, you know, these really cool lectures that you can still find on YouTube about the Bible that Jordan Peterson is referenced to, you know, the first thing he says is, you know, Christianity is embraced in translation. And so, you know, what John mentioned about, so when I do my adult Sunday school, and you know, people in my adult Sunday school room are maybe one or two have college education, but most don't. But you know, when I do that, I usually put multiple biblical translations in front of them, and you just begin to realize that even these translations are talking to each other. And so, this is it's, it's a it's a very living, vibrant thing. And I love Lorman, who you know a previous book, you know, when God talks back, she goes into a vineyard Pentecostal community and, you know, treats it as an anthropologist. And I thought there's a breath of fresh air because guess what? Pentecostals are people too. <laughs> they have a culture. I, I, I uh, feel remiss about uh, the other question that was asked by both of you um which is what does this have to do what could this have to do with stealing the culture and the religion that's not a religion um so i'm i'm actually i think it's been released in fact uh, no it's going to be released in an hour starting a new series with layman pascal and uh brendan dempsey graham dempsey uh, on um artful scaling of the religion that's not a religion um and I mentioned, of course, the critiques made by Paul, and I've taken to heart, and by Jonathan. Um, and uh, I won't go into that. Uh, I, I, I'm going to invite Paul and Jonathan when the series is done uh, to, you know, reflect and commentary in good faith and fellowship, which we've managed to keep going between us all. And I, and I definitely want that to keep going. I've said it before. Um, I'd rather relate the relationships pers uh, persevere than my particular theoretical claims, uh, because when I'm going to die, um, uh, it's the relationships I've cultivated that are going to be there with me, not the propositions that I uh, asserted. Um, um, so, uh, but I do think that I have a responsibility here, and I'll speak on uh, uh, just towards that. I do think, uh, and and. This is my, my, my stance. I do think that we're in a period of a kind of acceleration of things 
that we is unusual in human history. I know there is a tendency to every generation thinks it's the last generation and every generation thinks it's the generation before the apocalypse and every generation says the generation the current the older generation says the current generation is falling into sin and decadence um and um the, the problem of course with that is at some point it will in fact be true but up until now it's it's been largely um historical myth um so I want to be careful about that, and I don't believe in utopias, uh, but I do think Jordan Hall and others are right, don't Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmachtenberger and others, that we are going through in a kind of acceleration of history or the, the rate of change that our culture is trying to metabolize that is unique in history. Um, and I, I can give one example, and I, it's only one. The existence of social media accelerates social processes in a way for example, that the founders of the American Constitution could not possibly have foreseen. They depended on the, the size of the country and the speed of communication and the standard processes of socialization to keep uh, the Constitution running. And I would put it to you that one of the reasons why the American, the um, America, not just America, I'm using this just as an example, is in the crisis it's in right now is precisely because all of those assumptions, which seem so stable to the founding fathers, have been completely undermined by social media. Now, I only mean, I could give you lots of examples of this, which is why I think, right, um, uh, that, uh, that Jordan Hall has a very good point about accelerated change. Um, and so I, I wonder if, like the existing religions can adapt fast enough uh, precisely because, you know, that, that which makes us adaptive is also which makes us prone to self-deception. Uh, you know, Paul likes to point out, and I think fairly, and I'm not trying to judo him here, you know, that uh, religions do change, they do evolve, but they do it at a slower uh slower pace because they're oriented to the always rather than to the now. I think that's a good argument. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering if that is actually hamstringing the capacity to deal with this unique historical event we're facing, which is the acceleration of cognitive cultural change. And I just gave one of, of many possible examples. Um, and and um, so for me, what we have to do is accept that I think we're in an uncanny place right now. And what that means is not a nostalgia. We will, what we need to do is return to the shamanistic way of life or something, I think, ridiculous. I think, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to trespass on people who are neo-pagans and, and such, but I think the prospect of lifting shamanism out of its particular environment with its particular set of constraints, hunter-gatherer world, et cetera, pre-agrarian, all of this. And I'll just be here. That's to me like taking mind, all the rich ecology of mindfulness practices found within Buddhist context, shipping them over to North America, reducing them to meditation, and then doing it for people in the corporate world so that they're not so stressed out. I think that that's the same kind of thing where we're we, we like, these things are, 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 are terrifically embodied and embedded and therefore just lifting them um, in that way, I think is, is not plausible or reasonable. However, I do think what we need to do, if you'll allow me, is we need to tap into the depths of the shaman, but I would also say the depths of the philosopher, the depths of the prophet, right? Uh, and then exact that as best we can for what we're dealing with now. Um, and that's what I, I see the project I'm trying to uh, again, I am not the founder of this. I will refuse anybody who claims that or attributes that to me. This is going on. This will. This is going on and will go on without me. It is already happening, and I am just trying to help. I'm trying to articulate, reflect, guide, get get people linked together, provoke thought, provoke provoke discussion. And I'm going to say that. I'm going to keep saying that because people keep attributing to me a job that I do not want and I to which I do not aspire. Um, I don't want to be the founder of a religion. Uh, I don't aspire to be Moses. I aspire to be Socrates. Um, and so that's, that's different. Um, but I do think 
that's how I would uh, respond to the challenge of what does this mean uh, the, uh, about uh, the religion that's not a religion. And I have a caution about that, which is syncretism tends to rise when cultures meet and also when cultures face domicide. You, fit, you see tremendous syncretism happening during the Hellenistic domicide period, tremendous. You even get new deities created like Serapis and others. Um, and I do not think those solutions historically uh, turned out to be very good. The new philosophical schools like Stoicism, uh, right, and Epicureanism and eventually Neoplatonism were much better ju judging by quantity and quality of their permutation, right, at addressing the domicide and then simple syncretism, just joining things together. Um, and so um, I would hope that the religion that's not a religion is not just some sort of syncretic thing, but it takes from the past, exaps it into something like what was happened in Stoicism, like what happened in Neoplatonism. And again, it, with respect, what happened in Christianity? Uh, Christianity was very much, it didn't just take a bunch of ideas and put them together in syncretism. Jesus is, uh, I know, some people would not like when I say, Jesus is fundamentally different than Serapis in a lot of deep and profound ways. Um, and so, um, again, I'm not claiming that I'm, I'm Jesus or anything ridiculous like that. I'm just saying that at standing back with a historical eye, I don't think syncretism is the answer. Um, it wasn't the answer historically. And that tends, me to, tends to let, lead me to believe it's not a good candidate for how to deal with this particular kairos of ever accelerating cultural cognitive change. So that's how I would attempt to give a, a responsible answer to uh, what uh, uh, Julian and Capello asked me about what does this mean uh, for uh, the religion that's not a religion stealing the culture, et cetera. Thanks, John. I'm going to jump in there a little bit. Um, so, and I, I think this sort of connects what, to what Paul was saying earlier about, so, um, so I'm somebody who uses shamanic practices in, in my own stuff. Uh, and probably one of the foremost lessons to come out of that process for me is it is what it cultivates is not a theory. It's not a creed. It's not a set of beliefs. It is an attunement to connection to new meaning making to hybridity but not in a it's not there is no going back there's reinvention but the reinvention has to be tied to reality and there is a part of yeah. so what paul was talking about christianity being a living religion there's a life in christianity that allows it to reinvent itself yes as it moves into new cultures there's an attunement to reality there. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think Christianity has really good tools um, for doing that. Paul talks a lot about uh, uh, being able to transform tragedy and suffering into love and glory. And that's mm -hmm. like that, if you can do, in, in shamanism, that would be like a form of medicine, taking, taking a poison in people's lives yeah. and turning it into medicine. Pharmacon. It, yeah, exactly. It, if it can do that, it will move. It will continue to have life. It's when people look for, it, it's sort of like the difference between idolatry and revelation mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that idolatry is where the symbol, you're trying to get the symbol or the creed or the rule to do the work for you. And it's not going to save you. And it's especially not going to save us now in the sense that um, looking to our past in a kind of buffet table sort of propositional way of picking up beliefs that yes, yes, these yes. things will work together. There's no life there. That is, that is desperation. Yes. Um, so part, I mean, I find myself in a strange position as a non-Christian, probably a non-theist, although these days I'm not sure, um, wanting to help Christians talk to God. Like Lurman's work has been really influential to me because yeah, that's yeah, where the life yeah. is. Like there's, yeah, no, yeah. that's not my path. That's not the life that I have, but I can see uh, the life giving in that relationship that, that Christianity, Christians are cultivating. I want to help them. I want to be a part of 
that, you know, so, and yeah. I want to, but I also want to be able to help guide people who are not, you yes. know, uh, but to do that, I think one of the promises of the shamanic practices is um, if you want to bump people out of the propositional dominant mode, um, that is a pretty powerful, although there are risks involved as well, it's a pretty powerful way to do it. Um, and uh, to, to re like I was listening to a, a podcast, uh, it was an atheist podcast the other day, where an atheist was, was, was talking about his loss of faith and how it was not something he tried to do. It was a painful thing for him. Yeah, yeah. I'm listening to this as a, a, not necessarily a fellow atheist, but at least a fellow non-theist. And I'm feeling sorrow for this kid. You know, thinking you probably, mm. there are probably things you could have done to keep that relationship alive. And um, shamanism is properly speaking, not Christian, but it's also not not Christian. <laughs> so, and it's sort of like, can these techniques can be used uh, to bring new life into um, contact with the real, whatever form that takes where people are at. That, that's exactly it. That's that's exactly it. That the, the way you put it was beautiful, right? Uh, like you, you, there's no going back, but nevertheless, there there's a functionality there. And can we can we inventio that you know to discover and invent? Can we inventio that functionality again? And and, and I would put it to you that what what you put your finger on there is, I think for me to my mind, a defining feature of the religion that's not a religion. It should. It should help people that aren't called into the existing religions, but it should also help people who are called back into their existing religions. To me, I, 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 like it, it should be doing both. And that doesn't mean it sits above them in some monarch of place. But if, it, if, it's, if, if it's about trying to address the meaning crisis, I, I think of that verse by uh, St. Paul, right? We say, you know, capture every good thought, capture, you know, if it's good, if it's beautiful, this is, this is the central thing. If, if, like what you're doing can help people, like if you could say, here's shamanism, and I'm not, I don't want you to take up shamanism, but can it help you revive what the prophetic spirit might be like within Christian communities? I've had people say this kind of stuff to me, they, they'll say like, uh, you know, I didn't, I don't, you know, I don't get a, a, everything you're saying, but a lot of what you said helped me go back and rediscover. And I think what they mean is exactly what you're talking about, Capella. They learned how to reconnect the propositional and often reformulate and restructure the propositional. So it re-engaged the procedural and the perspectival and the participatory. I think Ritnarsh, the religion that's not a religion, should be that should be a that should be a criteria by which we evaluate its authenticity because it is ultimately about stealing the culture and giving giving back to the people. Oh goodness, giving back to the people, right? Um, the capacities for living in meaning. Look, we're going. We're look. There's stuff happening right now. We're going through the Great Resignation, where people are not going back to work. We're going through the staying in bed movement in China where people are opting out from work. This is a major big thing. And notice that mainstream media is not talking about it very much. And when they're talking about it, they don't know how to talk about it. And what this shows, and this is what I've been saying, people are willing to give, they're willing to take a huge hammer to their standard of living if it offers the promise of an increase in meaning. This is happening right now. This is happening right now. And Ritnar, like it should be, it, 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 its slogan should be helping people recover religio. And if they're recovering or recovery, or maybe helping people inventio, because it means both to discover and recover and invent, but the R's are good too, recover religio, right? If it's doing that, then it's the religion that's not the religion, as I think is what I see and what people are trying to do. Because if people are recovering religio, Right, that's the key thing, and I would hope that the religion that's not a religion would constantly dedicate itself to helping the people who can't find their way back to the uh, the world religions, and they're growing in number. And to pretend they're not there and they're not growing in number is pretense. And this is not that's not good. But, and I mean this sincerely, if it helps people return to their the religion that was their home 
and find religio in that again, that's also that's also what should be happening. Like who we 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 like we have no place from which to assert how the future is going to unfold. And so I think um, this is again why the dialectic into the logos is so important to me. Get it, it, we we this is such an urgent and such a pervasive and such a complex threat we're facing, set of threats we're facing, we need to work together profoundly. At, uh, right? I don't mean just extensively, I also mean the depths of us. We need to work profoundly together to address this. And so I thought what everything you said there, I thought it was beautiful. You can st- see how it's, 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 it's stirring me. So I really wanted to, I wanted to just expand on that and give you my reflections and response to it. Thank you. I, uh, maybe a couple things from from what John said before. I, I liked what he just said now, and and I very I very much had that that sense from John that he is, um, you know, he is really trying to help people overcome this meaning crisis. I mean, that's been that's been key to what he's been doing doing the whole time. Um, I, I, I suspect, you know, I, I loved, loved what John said in terms of the acceleration of things. Every generation believes, you know, this is, this is it, this is it. We can't, you know, we can't go any faster than this. And um, whether that will be the case or not, we will see. And that's always the case with every generation. Um, I, I tend to be I, I think I think one of the things that Christianity affords is is obviously a an optimism, because even though every Hollywood movie is always trying to prevent the apocalypse from happening, uh, the apocalypse from Hollywood's point of view is always uh, a bad thing, and and if you look at the day of the Lord imagery from the Hebrew prophets, which is very much where, um, you know, what New Testament writers, the apostle Paul, um, the apocalypse of John, which is the book revelation, singular, not revelations because there's revelations in it, but revelation singular, it's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. It's always a, it's always a sort of a, it's a dual thing that, um, it is. It is on one hand a breaking and a destroying of of old things. You know when the when the Babylonians invade and destroy the temple in Jerusalem. It is the day of the Lord, and the temple is destroyed, and the people cry, "How you know how 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 can we meet our God now that our temple is gone?" And well, the synagogues happen. And, you know, the Persians take the Babylonians and the temple is rebuilt and, and the temple is there again. And again, it's then destroyed by the Romans. And so the day of the Lord is always both this, this day of terror, but it's also a day of revelation and of hope and of new beginnings. And, and obviously as a Christian, I, I, I see that there is an expiration date on the world. And Christians, one of the one of the loosest areas of Christian theology, the most unsettled, is in fact eschatology. Uh, the Christian traditions can't come to any agreement. You know, there's the pre-mill and the ah-mill and the post-mill, and it's a whole big mess. But um, the Christ, Christianity, at least, is united that there there will come a, de, a definitive day and a departure from this this way, this you know, dispensation, I know it triggers a lot of dispensationalists, but that's still the best word for it. This dispensation of the world, this, this framing of history, and that day will end. And obviously you have then the, the coming of the Lord and the book of Revelation has, you know, all of this imagery, but it's, it's always, it's always a both and in that it is, it is destruction. And it is, it is a it is the dawning of a new thing and what you get in the day of the lord that's always it, it always scales all the way down 
So when the, when you sit across from your doctor and your doctor says, you know, you have pancreatic cancer and there's probably nothing we can do. There's the day of the Lord when you're in the hospital and you know, the, the, your, your wife or you give birth to a child, that's the day of the Lord. And it's this, it's this theme that comes up. It's all little tiny themes that scales all the way down to the individual that scales all the way out to the world. And at least in Christianity, we have this, we have this word given to us that the day is coming and it'll be terrifying and it'll be undoing, but it will also be glorious and good and the world will be set right. And I know that is a, um, that is an article of faith for Christians. But when, when we see this acceleration, I think that's part of the reason Christians all, always get apocalyptic. Luther was, um, you know, during the First World War, this is the war to end all wars. Second World War, Hitler is the Antichrist. I mean, we just go again and again, but um, part, of the, part of the package of Christianity for me is a, a not, not, it's, it's at least an aspirational embrace of the future, even despite our, our, our clear inability to know and say, oh, this is how all of these crises will work out. And, um, and even, you know, this is how, these are who your friends and enemies are. You have the, the parable of the wheat and the, and the weeds, which basically says, you can't tell. You, know, you can't tell who your friends and enemies always are. And so, I, I don't know, I, I, there's a lot of, and for very good reason, you know, we, the world always seems to paint itself into a corner. And I, I recommend people a book called The Alchemy of Air which is the story of the fixation of nitrogen. And, you know, coming up into the beginning of the 20th century, there were real questions as to how many people can this world feed? And, you know, you have the Haber-Bosch method by which you can take nitrogen from the air and, and out of that you have synthetic fertilizers and you have munitions <laughs> and, and you know the synthetic fertilizer. Oh, that's the good thing. Yeah, but then we've we've completely destroyed the nitrogen cycle. But we're allowing the world to have eight, nine, or ten billion people instead of three or four. And so I look at this and say, yeah, we're we're always we're always looking ahead and say, oh no, we've painted ourselves into a corner. And for me, well, I'm a Christian. I say, okay, I don't know. God knows. I will trust that. Yet though he slay me, I'll trust in him and we have a future and it's a good one. So I like that. I, I better um, jump in just because time's nearly up, by the way. Um, in fact, I think it is. Um, just to add to what Paul said, not from a Christian point of view, but I'm reminded that I think the word in Chinese for crisis is the same word for opportunity. I could be wrong about that. Please correct me, anybody. But I appreciate that point of view. I appreciate recognising the darkness, but also uh, having a method to get out of it, which, by the way, John, um, religion that's not a religion and all of your principles are very, very helpful to that. I actually think it's a beautiful science to help Christians and others. And I really didn't want this conversation to turn into a Christians versus the world kind of thing. I think the opposite, to be honest. So in any case, um, does anyone want to say some last words? I just wanted to thank uh... Uh, you and uh, Capella for putting this together. As always, I, 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 I want to thank Paul. I, I don't think that it was ever going to, with, with Paul and I, it's not going to turn into uh, a versus thing. Uh, we are very much about, um, I, I say it, Dialogos is when the people involved all get to a place they couldn't get to on their own. It doesn't mean they get to the same place or they come to agreement, but they've helped each other uh, to get beyond where they could get on their own. And to me, that, that procedural, perspectival, and sometimes even participatory change, um, our capacity to do that is, 
um, something that I place faith in, if I were to put it there. Um, our ability to do that is the thing we have to tap into now. Maybe it's not the end, but it's certainly, there is a meaning crisis. You may have heard of this. Um, and I do think, um, I do think <laughs> that addressing that is going to take our ability to engage in a dialogos and, and in fellowship. Um, and I just want to thank Paul. Paul always shows up in good faith and friendship and fellowship. And he speaks I admire this about him. I genuinely admire, uh, because this is, a, for me, a, another defining feature of genuine dialogos. The ability to, in good faith, give ground, to move towards the other person without necessarily, if you'll allow me to stretch the metaphor, abandoning one's position. And, and to get that kind of flexibility uh, back into our discourse, I think is really needed. And the way Paul exemplifies it, I think is admirable. So I wanted to just point that out and thank him for that. I want thank to you. second that and, and just say that both of you do a great job at that. I really appreciated your last discussion on, I think it was theism and non-theism. Towards the end of that dialogos, that life, that, uh, that, that living a perception of the good that is dynamic, interpenetrating, you guys were honing in on that. So I appreciate your discussions and I think you guys are getting, every time you talk, I think you guys get closer. And I wanna sort of thank Jules as well because that, that ability for respect and love to transcend difference and to allow people to use the exploration of boundaries and difference to actually strengthen the center, the, the thing that we have in common. Um, I think Jules exemplifies that uh, very, very well in, in our friendship. And um, I think more of that is, is, is what we need. So thank you all. Thank you. And likewise, to be sure, Capello. So I will stop the recording and say thank you to everybody. And thanks to everyone in the community. We welcome your comments. In fact, look forward to them. And uh, really want to thank um, John and Paul for giving us your time and also the inspiration that you give uh, in unifying people. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll, we'll see you around on the server. I'll stop the recording now.